Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. We uh, are continuing our reading of Cold Yule, Buck Jack, and we find out that some people are rather upset when Buck comes home for Christmas. Walter Cosser vanished back into the driftwood, so they did not stop there. John reflected that small children regarded him with nothing but lively interest and a desire to pet him or ride him, but grown men blanched at the sight of him. Chloe pointed to the Windrose tea shop. We could stop there, if you like, scene of the famous battle. What battle? Didn't you know? Mum challenged Teresa Sandell to a duel in there. Mum? With what? He suddenly remembered that when he was a kid, she had gone to karate classes for exercise. The person challenged got to pick the weapons, but the challenger often made suggestions that the challenged could not gracefully back down from. Teresa said poisons at first, you know, guess the cup? Don't worry, just laxatives. Anyway, Mum said yes, and Teresa backed down immediately. But she hates that I've changed. Yes, but she wasn't going to have Teresa saying Donna's family threatened you into the dedicated cavalry to keep you permanently away from Donna. Mum's been protecting my honor. Donna's honor, too, incidentally. Yes, she was awfully bucked about it. She's never liked Teresa, you know. I'm glad she enjoyed it. She never told you? Well, maybe she thought it would be boastful. And you're not the only one feeling all conflicted about this. I don't feel conflicted about transforming, he insisted. Good, but you feel conflicted or uncertain or just plain like hell about facing the folks, though you're doing it, brave lad. Well, at least now I know to say thank you to Mum. Good boy, have a sugar lump. He snorted and deliberately made it sound horsey. She chuckled. Do you feel conflicted about Jeff and me? Oh yes, she said matter-of-factly. On the one hand, I'm losing the two of you to a weird and dangerous life that makes you strangers to me, or I fear that. And you've hurt Mum and Dad. And to be frank, I worry about Val and Peter following you. On the other hand, Jeff seems to enjoy his new species no end, and I know you're pursuing a lifelong dream, and you were always going to hurt Mum and Dad some whenever you moved out, just as I did, and the two of you are damned impressive critters. Very balanced. Thank you for explaining. Maybe too balanced. There is the elephant in the living room, or the horse in the dining room. None of us has ever understood why you had such an extreme reaction to Donna's, Donna's rejection. I won't ask you why again. I've seen Dad start to ask again, then think better of it. But if you find a new way to explain it, I very much want to hear it. John sighed. You will. I very much want to let you understand. He stopped in front of the windrows. Right now, let's have a cuppa. I think I can fit behind a table. The evening went fairly well. John found two gallons of hot oatmeal waiting on the stove and made a good dent in it. Following Jeff's example again, he busied himself with Christmas decorating. After supper, he gave Val and Lucy short rides around the backyard and in front of the house, showed them the saddle he had brought, and promised longer rides later. The children went to bed. The grown-ups decorated some more. Mr. Weldon distributed drinks. Beer for John, wine for the others, which showed his father had been paying attention. Conversation was light and polite and only occasionally brittle. He saw them all off to bed. As was now normal for him, he was not at all sleepy. In the garage, he found the space heaters on, turned them off, finished unpacking, and did some Christmas wrapping. The night still lay before him. He did not feel like reading. Back at the base, he would have studied or chatted with the others. Studies were over, the other guys were absent, and the one fellow soldier he wanted to talk to most didn't arrive until tomorrow morning. He thought about his talk with Chloe, more talk than they had had in years, which he could fix by phoning more often, she would doubtless tell him. Thinking of the children he met at the bend and feeling both nostalgic and guilty, he re-entered the house as quietly as he could and poured himself half a glass of watered wine. On Christmas Eve, he remembered it had been full-strength wine. Ostensibly, this was a Christmas treat. It only now occurred to him that it would ensure excited children stayed in bed. 
the taste of watered wine brought back, as intended, a flood of childhood memories. But a great many of them included Donna, and so were now sad. Context is everything. He did not finish the half glass. He saw it had begun to snow. On impulse, he started to rummage through his packs for his boots. As he had said to his father, he did not need galoshes to keep his feet dry, but he did have boots. They had been meant to preserve a nice hoof shine, but they also reduced the ringing, clopping noise of shod hooves on pavement. John was of a mind to go for a walk in the snow, and he did not want to attract unnecessary attention. He put on hat and jacket, thought a moment, tucked the glamour t-shirt into the jacket, and stepped out. Outside, it snowed abundantly, enough to light the sky with reflected street lights and hush the slight traffic noises from downtown Stirk. He strolled to the end of the street, where it petered out in, in dirt road, branching into trails leading into the dark oak wood. He paused for a bit, but saw no one, heard no hail. To be on the safe side, he bowed in the direction of the woods and tipped his hat. It was great thinking weather. John so used it, pacing meditatively down Oakwood. Everything looked different from his new height. He had been too busy with people to notice this earlier. Had he ever seen it so before, empty and snowy? Yes, and even from this height, because he had been riding Jeff last Christmas. They had taken a break from a brotherly bull session in the garage, stallion session, and Jeff had invited him up for a quick ride sans saddle, just so they could talk while they got their blood stirring again. That was how he had known how noisy his own hooves would now be in an empty street. All through that session, he had wanted to ask Jeff why he had taken the transformation, just as the rest of the family wanted to ask him now. He had not asked, not wanting to end a fragile and final seeming good time. He had expected their lives to part, Jeff's into the cavalry, his into marriage to Donna. As he approached the bend, he saw one pedestrian, a man in a long coat and broad-brimmed hat. It was Gil Faber, striding straight toward him. Deciding it would be polite, John altered course slightly to meet him, but then noticed Faber slow down. It struck him that Faber was one who, given the choice, would have crossed the street to avoid him. He stopped, standing patiently with arms folded behind his back over his withers. Mr. Weldon, Faber greeted or stated, stopping in front of him. Mr. Faber, John replied, tipping his hat. What brings you out? It did not sound quite chatty. I don't sleep much, sir. The sir had slipped out. John wasn't sure he was happy with it, but Faber was a generation older, after all, and good manners cost nothing, as Fletcher liked to say. And the snow is beautiful. I hope you weren't thinking of going past the bend. No one said going round the bend. The joke had staled two generations back. I was going down onto the beach, sir, John said. He was careful of his tone. It was respectful, but an announcement, not asking for permission. He did not mentally, he did not, he mentally contended, need permission. This guy was no constable, just the constable's son, though he was certainly out patrolling for her. And anyway, John was breaking no law. Is that wise? Faber asked. The sundering was the luck that hid magic from the unsundered world. Try to hide magic or its unmistakable products, like John, and luck was with you. But every move you made to break cover was met with worse and worse luck until you quit. And the sundering didn't care if the rest of Oakwood Street got caught up in the consequences. I think I've made it fairly easy for the sundering, John answered. It's the middle of the night, it's a snowstorm, I'm getting off the road soon, I've muffled my hooves, he lifted a foreleg to show the boot, Faber drew back a bit, and there's this. He pulled the t-shirt out of his jacket and displayed it to Faber. Glamour? asked Faber, either able to feel the magic or making a reasonable guess. Yes, sir, as a horse. Unusual, but not unnatural. Faber gave a reluctant nod, but gazed fixedly at the shirt. John felt sure he could sense the spell, maybe read it, a useful skill for many people, including a constable in waiting. In the few seconds of silence that followed, it seemed to John that Faber thawed, stopped worrying about the bad luck John might provoke from the sundering, and became focused on the shirt. Would you mind demonstrating it for me? He asked, and it really sounded like a request, not a polite order. So, not at all, sir, John answered. 
Faber even volunteered to hold John's clothes as he stripped so they needn't be balanced awkwardly on his back or laid in the snow. It was easier to stand naked under this man's academic interest than under his parents' uneasy concern. He popped the glamour shirt on. Very good, Faber said admiringly. Perfect image. Can you speak with it on? Yes, sir. To me, it just seems I'm wearing a t-shirt. Watch. He reached out and took his jacket, undershirt, and hat from Faber, to whom it seemed that the horse had gathered up the garments with its mouth with bizarre facility. He chuckled as John popped the hat on his head. Unusual but not unnatural, John repeated, except for the talking. Hmm, Faber looked concerned again. But if a mundane miner became curious about a horse loose in the street in the middle of the night, then the luck of the sundering would help me hide or evade them, John answered in a tone of conscious patience, as one might say, and if I jumped in the ocean, I'd get wet. We both know this. Hmm, Faber grunted again, most likely. The sundering, after all, leaked a bit, or myths and legends would not circulate in the Mont Minor. But it was still a concession. Well, wear your shirt in good health. You won't be cold? No, sir. He brushed his equine shoulder. The horse appeared to nuzzle it. Winter coat. When you were changing, I saw a stripe down your back. Is that a mane? Do you have to keep it shaven? It's a bit of mane, sir, but I don't need to shave it. It's just short, vestigial. Left over from when we all had manes, Faber asked sardonically. Rudimentary, then. Well, good glamour or not, it seems to me that you push the sundering by visiting here, but I won't second-guess the cavalry, and you are taking precautions. Enjoy the night, then. Thank you. You too, sir. Good manners cost nothing. And look how pleasantly they let Faber say he wished John had not come home. He watched Faber out of sight, then reveled in his recovered privacy. He reared on his hind legs and spread his arms. All this space. No cramped human-scale house, no pressing, staring crowd. He trotted to a wooden stairway that led from the sidewalk to the beach, then clattered down to the sand. Only after he was there did he recall the difficulty stairs had given him when he was newly transformed, agility classes just begun. Now this body simply did his will. It fit him. It was him. He frisked on the sand. Dance like nobody is looking. Nobody was looking. An onlooker would have seen a horse, a very silly horse, bouncing about with clothes in its mouth. Bouncing done, he sat on the sand, four legs up, and gazed out to the sea that led everywhere. He thought about the gates on the sea that led really everywhere and what he might see beyond them. He wondered where on this beach Harry Morley had dragged himself ashore. He thought of the seemings for merfolk his father had mentioned, and wondered if Harry had found one in Verkel, and if it had helped. Harry would give anything, John supposed, to not have been transformed and have his old life back. And here he was, just as adamantly galloping into a transformed life and leaving the old one behind. How to leave an old life behind and not leave the people in that life whom you loved? No wonder they were confused. Some you did leave, though. One. She was in New York, he had heard, or he would have been much more on edge moving about Oakwood Street. But the rest deserved an explanation. It was excellent thinking weather. Eventually his rump got cold. For that matter, his arms were cold and he was tired of holding his jacket. He put it back on over the glamour shirt and his regular t-shirt tucked inside. Now, an onlooker, had there been one, would see a horse in a jacket in Stetson. Comedy, not mythology. He galloped down the beach to warm up, then cantered back. The wet sand was firm and a pleasure to run on. Then up the stairs and home to bed. He got up early, as was now natural, and cunningly got coffee, tea, and sausages ready for the family, but didn't get around to the big pot of oatmeal, leaving it for his mother. This gave her something to do to escape if she needed, or to do for him if she wanted. It seemed to work, and she went so far as to congratulate him on the kitchen skills he'd learned. Then it was harness up and head down the street again with Chloe for more shopping. There was no deep conversation because it was even busier than last evening. At least fewer people mistook him for Jeff, either because of the better light or because word had got around. 
Jack, wow, look at you. Roger was obviously confused, but trying to be happy and welcoming. John gave him a big smile and a salute. Oh, John, so it's true. What to say? He gave Mrs. Drew a sharper smile and tipped his hat. Ah, fuddle, Jack, you okay? Even worse. I'm fine, Matt, I'm fine. John, glad to see you. Come visit while you're home. That was more like it. Thanks, Mrs. Miles. Diversion arrived as a duck fluttering under his feet. He jigged, startled. He might even have started to bring a hoof down on the bird by accident, but the new parts of him really, really didn't like stepping on bad footing and saved both of them. John crouched and caught the thing. It was, of course, Elsie, the Dawson's pet. That bird, exclaimed Mrs. Miles, thinks she owns the street. It's a good thing cars don't come along here much. Mr. Dawson hurried up with apologies and a leash. His eyes, like Mrs. Miles, kept sweeping over John, but both were determined to be of the unflappable school. They were soon well into the shopping stretch. Young voices hailed him from across the street, Charlotte, Robert, and Andy. He waved back, smiling. He had the glamour shirt tucked into his jacket. He had been hoping to see them again and show it to them, but not this moment. They waited on. Chloe again, as good as invisible. He made a note to ask her if it bothered her. Should he offer her a ride, get her up out of the press? She'd probably decline, but should he still offer? He started to lean down to her ear. Thwap! A cold sting on his haunch. Jack, what's wrong? Chloe reached for his arm. In that moment, his love for her grew. However accepting she might be, he was still a big strange creature now, still new to her, but she still reached for him. He had jumped a few inches. It might have been much worse, but he had already had his guard up from working through the crowd. Someone threw a snowball at me, he told her, looking back at his rump. Oh! Her eyes flashed as she scanned the street. Here was more kin ready to fight a duel for the honor of the Weldon Light Cavalry. This time he reached for her arm. Just horseplay, he muttered, no harm done. An anonymous insult, she replied, deliberately loud, shameful. They plowed on in silence, then made a point of several hellos. John pondered, was someone simply venting mischief and would have chosen some other target if he hadn't been there? Or did someone want to make him feel unwelcome? Or, no better, make Jeff feel unwelcome? Had they wanted him to rear or bolt or trample, disgracing himself? No knowing. A clutter of stalls had been set out on the sidewalk. They entered the crowd there. Faces turned toward them. Hello, Jeff. Jack! About a month ago, they had started training in mixed martial arts. We're nothing if not brawlers, Captain Fletcher had said, showing genial teeth and cracking his knuckles. Read the myths. But, sir, in the myths we always lose, Charlie Horse pointed out. We're here to fix that. John had been paired with Rennie, a.k.a. Horsepower, who was, like any draft horse, massive but mild. He dutifully swung at John, and if he grappled, his strength was amazing, but John and Fletcher and the others all knew his heart wasn't in it. Amid shouts of goading and encouragement, like, You big marshmallow! Come on, lad, give us the heavy artillery! Horse! Power! Horse! Power! John tried a deliberately annoying series of light punches to the face. It worked. Horsepower scowled, pivoted on his forelegs, and drove a rear hoof into John's chest. John doubled over on the point of impact, crumpled, and lay face down on the frosty grass. It was some time before the pain began. During that time, he noted the curious sensation of breathing only with his horse lungs. His human lungs were quite stunned. He thought later that his human heart might have been too. Dr. Blackholt x-rayed him and found nothing broken. It was a tribute, he said, to young bones, and cheerfully told John he'd have been killed if he'd been a man simple. Horsepower had been enormously, of course, apologetic. This was like that. John the man stood stunned, breathless. John the horse was panting a series of shallow, panicky breaths and would bolt in a moment. John, THE John, pulled himself together. She wasn't in New York after all. Hello, Donna. Delivery cool and even. Very good. He could think of nothing else to say. 
and like the other time, the pain would start soon. He stared. She looked good, very smartly dressed, unfamiliar, about as gobsmacked as he felt. This is the point in the fairy tale when the princess or the clever maiden or whoever realizes that the bear or swan or frog is the transformed male lead. But this time there's no reprieve from the bearskin, no disenchanting shirt of nettles, no rescuing kiss. This fairy tale broke. Her eyes roved over him, face to hooves and back, man body to horse body and back. She stuttered. Finally, she just asked, why? He stared back. What to say? Anything? Had she not known he had done it? Now she did not know why. He could tell her. After last night's long thinking on the beach, he had figured out how to say it. But here, in the street, with, yes, there were her brothers and sister and some of the rest of them, the friends that had been more hers than his. In front of them, no. Speak privately later, Holy St. Martin, no. He had nothing more to say to her. Chloe was speaking. Well, he was always interested in the idea ever since Jeff changed and he was so happy with it. Exploratory trade expeditions were really a compromised position to meet you halfway. So when that no longer applied, he went back to plan A. It's just logical. Horse sense, you might say. She smiled brightly and put her hand on John's back. Right, Jack? How weird was it to stand silently by while your sister defended your new shape to your old girlfriend? Probably not as weird as taking the new shape, but it had to be close. Right, excuse me. Lieutenant Sanders would have been proud to see the smartly executed Agility 3 rotation in place, slightly zigzagged to avoid two pedestrians, followed by a brisk but calm business-like trot back down Oakwood Street. For the next few minutes, John was oblivious of his environment. Technically, he saw and heard and felt, walked and maybe even spoke, but he lived almost entirely in his head, thinking over this encounter with Donna and the one before that, when he had been human. On the previous occasion, he had shown up at her house with flowers, a ring in his pocket, and prepared phrases in his mind. She was surprised and a bit puzzled about the flowers. The phrases... She had been about as stunned as she had been just now, there in the street. He did not recall all her words exactly, he had tried to forget them, but he was sure they included the deadly, don't be silly, and the almost equally bad, it's very sweet of you, but... Somewhere, he saw she had never in the slightest conceived of their relationship as he had. She had never been in love with him or supposed him in love with her. And he had left at a near run down the route he had, he now realized, just now retraced and ended up in the oak wood as he was now. Mortification and despair had competed for his attention. It had been winter then too, though long after Christmas. And he was mortified again, maybe. He wasn't sure, but not despairing. He had nothing to despair of. What he was, was at a loss. What to do next? He needed to do something he would not be ashamed of. What? Nothing came to mind. He shifted to another subject. How could she not have known? Yes, she had left for New York a few days later. No, they had not communicated again. Yes, his family had kept pretty quiet about his enlistment in the dedicated cavalry, but it hadn't been a dead secret. Her friends and family had known, he was sure, but none had told her. Had they thought it too trivial to mention? Or too painful? Had Donna told them he had proposed? Of course they knew about the breakup. He hadn't spoken to them either, so he had no data. He heard a car go by. Looking around, he could see the highway through a thin veil of trees. Anyone looking for an odd sight in the woods could certainly find one. With mechanical haste, he changed jacket and undershirt for the glamour shirt. Had he been retracing his steps? He couldn't remember. Had he been planning to walk all the way back to the base at Uffham? Ridiculous. Hey, Bob, there's a horse here asking for directions to a place called Uffham in Berkshire. 
Anyway, he had been trying to think of a course of action that he would not be ashamed of. Nothing like confronting Donna. Nothing like running away, either. And again, he was back where he had been. Once his general turmoil and fretting had died down, once Donna was off to America, he'd been looking for something to do with himself. Well, he couldn't enlist in the cavalry again. He should, he realized, have simply gone on shopping with Chloe. Instead, he had run away. How to retrieve the situation? He began working his way back home through the trees, turning over actions and excuses and apologies in his mind. Again, he had been deep in his own head. Again, a noise pulled him out. Another set of crunching footsteps. He looked up and saw Jeff riding down a trail toward him. He felt warmth sweep from heart to heart. But riding. John studied the sight. Jeff sat, two-legged, on a buckskin horse, wearing a cavalry Stetson, a neatly trimmed beard, standard duty jacket, and the pants and boots of the standard cavalry. The horse regarded him with the same lively interest as Jeff. The very same. Well, here's a thing, said his brother, a pack horse wandering in the woods talking to itself. I'd ask if you were a puka or a headley cow, except you sound just like my brother. Doesn't the talking spoil the point of the disguise? Take off that glamour and let me see you. Right, you too. John took off the glamour shirt and saw, when it cleared his eyes, Jeff united on his own hooves, holding a neckerchief in his hand. He looked John over. Another blasted buckskin. Wonder if Dad would come out buckskin if he were turned. Wouldn't that put Mum in a state? And we'll hear what the brothers have to say to each other next time.